The architecture of Islamic mosques and tombs is an invaluable treasure of world heritage. Many countries have taken inspiration from this tradition. Islam had conquered uh, Spanish part, parts, Spain and a part of Portugal and part of France also in the year 712, uh, 750. And after that, I mean, this uh, architecture gradually traveled from Spain, it went to Portugal, from Portugal into France. And then it has uh, influenced a lot of uh, Islam, I mean, world architecture, whether in almost all the countries. For example, uh, one is surface decoration with tiles. The tile system was not there in uh, European architecture. And in Islam, it is known as Zuleojos. Uh, and it is in European architecture also, and especially in Portugal, they call it azulejos, that is the tiles. And if you see the color, that would itself tell you that, I mean, it has been introduced directly from Islamic architecture. And that is even now being acknowledged also. After the Romans, the building of arches and domes had also been forgotten in Europe. These were reintroduced in this time. It's good to know that the art of dome construction, arch construction, came, actually went from Iran to Europe. Actually, the architecture of the egg is employed in the dome. What is important is, according to the beliefs of the old Persians, if you put an egg exactly perpendicular on the ground, even if you put the hoof of a camel on it, it won't break because of the cellular connection. Islamic architecture is characterized by a few visible symbols. One is the arch, which frames the space. Second is the dome, which looms over the sky and skyscape. And the third is the minaret, which pierces the skies. These minarets were actually the symbols in the middle of the deserts, representing the fire, which was lit on the top, to guide the travelers when they traveled in the middle of the desert. The dome represents the infinite, it represents the sky, as the tomb architecture represents the infinite and finite both. So dome has a very important role to play. It is well known that the most famous Islamic monument of the world, the Taj Mahal, is in India. What is not equally well known is that the second oldest mosque in the world is also in India, in Kerala. In fact, India has a vast and rich architectural heritage of Islam, from Kerala in the south till Kashmir in the north, from Tripura in the east till Gujarat in the west. Islam came to India not from the north, as is very commonly believed, uh, but it came through the Arab traders in what is today the region of Malabar in Kerala uh, and uh, developed as a trading community, as a merchant community and you can see still traces of, uh, of that community amongst the Mapalas uh, who, uh, who are basically, who trace their ancestry to, to the Arabs. Since ancient times, India had considerable trade contact with the Arab world. In the first century AD, Pliny the Elder writes in Rome about the routes which existed going to India. He mentions the July monsoon winds that traders used to catch to bring them to the Indian coast. He mentions a ship which left the coast of Arabia and took 40 days to reach Musi Risi, which was then the name of present-day Kodungalur. 
with the advent of Islam, Arab traders became the carriers of the new faith. Behind me here, you see the first mosque which was made in India. It was made in Kodun Galur by Raja Cheruman Perumal. It was made in 629 AD within the lifetime of the Prophet. Kail Patnam is an ancient town on the mouth of the Tamira Pirani River. It is about one kilometer from its mouth. The Kodal Karai Mosque was built here by Arab traders as early as Hijri 12 or 633 AD. It is the first mosque to be built in Tamil Nadu. Kail Patnam tiene muchas mezquitas tempranas. De hecho, Kerala en la costa oeste de India y Tamil Nadu en la costa este tienen numerosas mezquitas construidas durante los años. En Nagore, en la costa este, hay una darga grande que ha sido construida. India llegó a ser la casa a todas las tradiciones del Islam, Sunni, Shia y Sufi. Islam in the north, of course, uh, came through uh, to different invasions, starting with the invasion of Mahmud of Ghazna, who went as far as Gujarat. But thereafter, there was a peaceful intrusion of uh, different kinds of Sufi saints, uh, of traders, of merchants, and of other individuals who were basically moving into India, moving into the north of India uh, because of the political instability or the dynastic changes that were taking place in and around Central Asia and Afghanistan. Uh, so the, gradually uh, this is how a community uh, developed, a very small community which developed, which of course increased its strength once the Turkish rule was established Kuwatul Islam was the first mosque built by Muslims soon after the conquest of Delhi. This mosque was built in 1193. And here every inch of the Maksura is beautifully carved. There are a number of Quranic verses also very beautifully written on this one as if it has been written on wax. Some of the medieval writers have used this word that it is so beautifully done that it appears that it has been done on wax. On stones, it was not possible. El monumento más impresionante en el complejo Qutub es el Qutub Menar sí mismo. Fue construido a principios del siglo XIII por Qutubuddin Ebag, el sultán de Delhi. Es uno de los menaretes más altos del mundo y es 72,5 metros alto. The concept of uh, Minar is West Asian and Central Asian. All over West Asia and Central Asia, in 12th and 13th century, there were more than 70 uh, minarets like this one. But just before Qutub Minar, there were two very important minarets in West Asia. One was in Ghazni and the second was in Khaja Siapur in Jam. So that also had this kind of circular and angular floatings. Qutub Minar is directly influenced by that one. In Persia and Central Asia, their building material was mostly bricks. They were, it was not stone, so they were not having beautiful craftsmen working on this kind of stones. In India, we had very excellent uh, craftsmen who were working on Indian temples. Those craftsmen were very effectively used here in this monument. And that is why we find the excellent carvings in this Qutub Minar. Uh, Ibn Battuta was a traveler who had traveled all over the Islamic Empire. He had started from Africa, he had seen the uh, Samarkand, he had seen Damascus. And when he came to India, he records that nowhere in the world, nowhere in the Islamic Empire, 
we have a, a minar like this one. Mientras tanto, las influencias islámicas siguieron creciendo en el sur, en el Deccan. El fin del siglo XV vio el establecimiento de cinco sultanatos en el Deccan. Estos eran Ahmednagar, Bijapur, Golconda, Bedar y Berar. El sultán de Bijapur era un descendiente de la dinastía de Otomono de Estambul. El sultán de Golconda era un príncipe turco que se había refugiado a India. Los sultanes eran seguidores de la secta Shia del Islam y eran aliados cercanos de los gobernantes de Safivad de Irán. Una cultura distinta se desarrolló en la comunidad cosmopolita del Deccan. Las calles de los sultanatos de Khan estuvieron llenas de turcos, persas, árabes y africanos. En India, el Deccan llegó a ser el mayor centro de aprendizaje de árabe y literatura. Los Qutub Shahis fundó la dinastía dirigente de Golconda en 1512. Ellos fueron cometidos a retener las raíces de su identidad persa y cultura. En este tiempo, los arquitectos y los artistas emigraron al Deccan de Persia. Sultán Ibrahim Adil Shah II ruled Bijapur from 1580 to 1627. He was a contemporary of Emperor Akbar, the Mughal emperor who ruled in North India. A visit to his Raza or tomb is a very special pleasure. In fact, it is like a pilgrimage for somebody deeply interested in Indian art. For some of the finest miniature paintings ever made in India were made in his rule. The Gol Gumbas in Bijapur is the tomb of Sultan Muhammad Adil Shah the successor of Sultan Ibrahim Adil Shah II. Muhammad ruled in Bijapur from 1627 to 1657 AD. This is the largest dome ever to be built in the Islamic world. It measures 37.92 meters on the inside. A particular attraction is a central gallery popularly called a whispering gallery, where each sound that you make is echoed distinctly seven times. Every time I speak here, it echoes so many times. Tourists love to come here. La fortaleza masiva de Bidar fue construida en los siglos XIV y XV. Es una de las fortalezas más formidables del país. Esto tiene paredes que corren a 5,5 kilómetros de adentro. Adentro tiene palacios hermosos, dos mezquitas, una madarsa, jardines ornamentales y piscinas. Quizás el Tarkashmel aquí fue construido para la esposa turca del sultán. When I managed to visit these sites and study them with a little bit more detail, we were able to appreciate what great centers these were of architecture, culture and learning. Iran and Central Asia only had single courts. If you were a soldier, a religious figure, an intellectual, an artistic person, and you could not find a sponsor maybe in what is now Iran or Uzbekistan, chances are, you, if you went to the Deccan, you could find some sort of patronage. And there was this continuous migration of people, ideas, artistic devices and architectures from the Near East into the Deccan. 
we have in fact one very remarkable example of an architectural transplant from Central Asia. This is the great madrasa of Mahmud Gawan from the 1480s in Bida. Now if you would take a photograph of this and put a label and saying madrasa in Uzbekistan or part of um, eastern Iran, it will be very hard to tell the difference. Timur, when he came to Hindustan, he was struck by the beauty of our historical cities. This is Malfuzat -e Timuri, the autobiography of Timur. He has given a description about the cities of India and then he says, I ordered that all the artisans and clever mechanics who were masters of their respective crafts should be picked out from among the prisoners and set aside. And accordingly, some thousands of craftsmen were selected to await my command. I had determined to build a masjid -e jami in Samarkand, the seat of my empire, which should be without a rival in any country. So I ordered that all the builders and stone masons of India should be set apart for my own special service. In some other records, it is said that he had taken near about 3,000 artisans from India who were employed again in the, in the construction of the Jami Masjid at uh, Samarkand. 1526 was a year which changed the political map of India. It was the year of the advent of Babur who founded the great Mughal dynasty. Babur was a descendant of the Turco-Mongol conqueror Timur whose family ruled in Persia. La dinastía fundada por Babur fue uno de los mayores que había visto el mundo. Gobernaron un imperio enorme cuya fama se extendió a todo el mundo. La cultura y el arte que habían creado ayudaron a dar una forma al desarrollo del futuro en todas las esferas de vida del subcontinente indio. What is extremely important to recognize about the Mughals is that when they came to power and they took over northern India or Hindustan, they had already been more than 250 years of Islamic building traditions, religious traditions, culture and literature in India. Humayun's tomb, which might be considered the first great imperial masterpiece of the new dynasty, sponsored by the 20-year-old Akbar in memory of his father, is very much related to the previous architecture of Delhi. Then we look at the design of the tomb itself, with these earlier systems, which were already well entrenched in India, like the little domed chhatris, the different colored stonework, and we place all of those around a central dome, which is in white marble, an Indian material, not a Middle Eastern material, but the dome is bulbous. It has this sort of shape and it's a double dome. And it's something which was brought into India from the Timurid tradition of Uzbekistan. Agra era la capital imperial de Akbar a mediados del siglo XVI. La fortaleza aquí era una de las más poderosas del norte de India desde tiempos tempranos. En 1565, el emperador Akbar ordenó la reconstrucción de la fortaleza. La fortaleza tiene palacios de emperador Akbar, Jangir y Shah Jahan. Los más prominentes entre todas las estructuras son los edificios de mármol blancos del Shah Jahan. Hasmel es uno de los edificios elegantes que están construidos del mármol puro. En 1571, el emperador Akbar decidió construir una nueva capital. Una ciudad magnífica fue construida en un sitio que no estaba muy lejos de la capital anterior en Agra. Fue llamada Fatehpur Sikri. In building Fatehpur Sikri, no cost was too much, no effort was too great for the Emperor Akbar. He wished to make the city true to his conception, 
As a matter of fact, miniature paintings of that period show the emperor going amidst the workers, supervising the construction of the city himself. Fateh Apur Sikri is one of the best cities that is presented symmetrically to the world of the medieval in two parts. La mezquita magnífica Jami Masjid He aquí fue construida en el modelo de que hay en el Meca. The world's best known tomb stands testimony to a timeless love story. The Taj Mahal was built in 1648 by the Mughal emperor Shah Jahan in memory of his beloved wife Arjumand Banu Begum, known to the world as Mumtaz Mahal. La construcción de Taj Mahal era una hazaña de ingeniería estupenda. Es construido del mármol y embutido por piedras semipreciosas sutilmente. 20.000 trabajadores y artesanos maestros trabajaron durante 17 años para levantar este edificio magnífico. En Jannat hay dos rivers. And the same kind of two rivers you can see in Taj Mahal also. The whole entire monument has been conceived in a, in a very elaborate way with uh, the domes, with the minarets and the cavity and rotundity of the monument. The most important thing which beautifies the monument more than anything else is the Pietra Dura work or inlay work. For depicting one particular flower, they have used 64 stones of various sites various shades and of various colors also. And if you lit a torch into that one, you feel that it is, the whole thing is blooming. A mediados del siglo XVII, el emperador Mughal Shah Jahan construyó una nueva capital imperial en Delhi. Él construyó su palacio dentro de la gran fortaleza roja que él construyó a las riberas del río Ramna. Tivane Am, o el pasillo del auditorio público, es donde el emperador oiría peticiones de la gente. Tivane Khas es el pasillo del auditorio privado. Estas estructuras están de las glorias de la fortaleza roja. Cientos de mezquitas y tumbas islámicas de la gran belleza están extendidas en todas partes. En el oeste del país, en Gujarat, es el sitio de patrimonio universal de Champaner del siglo XV. En el este, hay una mezquita impresionante Nahuda Masjid y varios otros en Kolkata. Hay dargas famosas en Akho y otros sitios de Assam. There are fine mosques even in the farthest corners of India. Here we are in the northeast of India in Agartala in the state of Tripura. This is the beautiful Gedu Miyaki Masjid behind me. In the mountainous state of Kashmir, Islamic architecture was influenced by ancient Hindu and Buddhist traditions. These were combined with influences coming from Persia and from Turkestan. Wood was used extensively in the mosques and tombs of Kashmir. I think one should, one should uh, recognize the fact that, uh, that uh, Islam is, is, is in India is not peripheral to anything. Uh, that Islam in India has been a very uh, uh, dynamic force. Uh, it has been a very invigorating force. To the entire Islamic architecture, the contribution of Indian architecture is outstanding. You can take two monuments as symbolical monuments. One is Qutub Minar and the second one is Taj Mahal. India tiene una herencia enorme viva de arquitectura islámica.
Estos monumentos son un gran tesoro de cultura india y muchos son reconocidos como monumentos de patrimonio universal. En estos vemos la confluencia del talento local con inspiraciones de Irán, Arabia y Asia Central. Estas mezquitas, tumbas, madrasas, palacios y fortalezas son un tesoro hermoso y único de la herencia de la arquitectura islámica. It is well known that the most famous Islamic monument of the world, the Taj Mahal, is in India. What is not equally well known is that the second oldest mosque in the world is also in India, in Kerala. In fact, India has a vast and rich architectural heritage of Islam, from Kerala in the south till Kashmir in the north, from Tripura in the east till Gujarat in the west. With the advent of Islam, Arab traders became the carriers of the new faith. Behind me here, you see the first mosque which was made in India. It was made in Kodun Galur by Raja Cheruman Perumal. It was made in 629 AD, within the lifetime of the Prophet. Kail Patnam is an ancient town on the mouth of the Tamira Pirani River. It is about one kilometer from its mouth. The Kodal Karai Mosque was built here by Arab traders as early as Hijri 12 or 633 AD. Kuwatul Islam was the first mosque built by Muslims soon after the conquest of Delhi. This mosque was built in 1193 and here every inch of the maksura is beautifully carved. There are a number of Quranic verses also very beautifully written uh, on this one as if it has been written on wax. Some of the medieval writers have used this word that it is so beautifully done that it appears that it has been done on wax. On stones it was not possible. El monumento más impresionante en el complejo Qutub es el Qutub Menar sí mismo. Fue construido a principios del siglo XIII por Qutubuddin Ebak, el sultán de Delhi. Es uno de los menaretes más altos del mundo y es 72,5 metros alto. Mientras tanto, las influencias islámicas siguieron creciendo en el sur, en el Deccan. El fin del siglo XV vio el establecimiento de cinco sultanatos en el Deccan. Estos eran Ahmednagar, Bijapur, Golconda, Bedar y Berar. El sultán de Bijapur era un descendiente de la dinastía de Otomono de Estambul. El sultán de Golconda era un príncipe turco que se había refugiado a India. Los sultanes eran seguidores de la secta Shia del Islam 
y eran aliados cercanos de los gobernantes de Safivad de Irán. En India, el Deccan llegó a ser el mayor centro de aprendizaje de árabe literatura. The Gol Gumbas in Bijapur is the tomb of Sultan Muhammad Adil Shah, the successor of Sultan Ibrahim Adil Shah II. Muhammad ruled in Bijapur from 1627 to 1657 AD. This is the largest dome ever to be built in the Islamic world. It measures 37.92 meters on the inside. We have in fact one very remarkable example of an architectural transplant from Central Asia. This is the great madrasa of Mahmud Gawan from the 1480s in Bida. Now if you would take a photograph of this and put a label and saying madrasa in Uzbekistan or part of um, eastern Iran, it will be very hard to tell the difference. 1526 was a year which changed the political map of India. It was the year of the advent of Babur who founded the great Mughal dynasty. La dinastía fundada por Babur fue uno de los mayores que había visto el mundo. Gobernaron un imperio enorme cuya fama se extendió a todo el mundo. Humayun's tomb which might be considered the first great imperial masterpiece of the new dynasty sponsored by the 20-year-old Akbar in memory of his father is very much related to the previous architecture of Delhi. Then we look at the design of the tomb itself with these earlier systems which were already well entrenched in India like the little domed chhatris, the different colored stonework and we place all of those around a central dome which is in white marble, an Indian material not a middle eastern material but the dome is bulbous it has this sort of shape and it's a double dome and it's something which was brought into india from the timurid tradition of uzbekistan agra era la capital imperial de akbar a mediados del siglo 16 la fortaleza aquí era una de las más poderosas del norte de India desde tiempos tempranos. En 1565, el emperador Akbar ordenó la reconstrucción de la fortaleza. La fortaleza tiene palacios de emperador Akbar, Jangir y Shah Jahan. Los más prominentes entre todas las estructuras son los edificios de mármol blancos del Shah Jahan. En 1571, el emperador Akbar decidió construir una nueva capital. Una ciudad magnífica fue construida en un sitio que no estaba muy lejos de la capital anterior en Agra. Fue llamada Fatehpur Sikri. Fatehpur Sikri es una de las mejores ciudades que está presentada simétricamente al mundo medieval entre en todas partes. The world's best known tomb stands testimony to a timeless love story. The Taj Mahal was built in 1648 by the Mughal emperor Shah Jahan in memory of his beloved wife Arjumand Banu Begum, known to the world as Mumtaz Mahal. La construcción de Taj Mahal era una hazaña de ingeniería estupenda. Es construido del mármol y embutido por piedras semipreciosas sutilmente. 20.000 trabajadores y artesanos maestros trabajaron durante 17 años para levantar este edificio magnífico. A mediados del siglo XVII, el emperador Mughal Shah Jahan construyó una nueva capital imperial en Delhi. Él construyó su palacio dentro de la gran fortaleza roja que él construyó a las riberas del río Ramna. Tivane Am, o el pasillo del auditorio público, es donde el emperador oiría peticiones de la gente. 
Diván Ejaz es el pasillo del auditorio privado. Estas estructuras están de las glorias de la fortaleza roja. India tiene una herencia enorme viva de arquitectura islámica. Estos monumentos son un gran tesoro de cultura india y muchos son reconocidos como monumentos de patrimonio universal. En estos vemos la confluencia del talento local con inspiraciones de Irán, Arabia y Asia Central. Estas mezquitas, tumbas, madarsas, palacios y fortalezas son un tesoro hermoso y único de la herencia de la arquitectura islámica.